I've got a bit of an exciting show for you because we're going to go to ancient Egypt. You heard me right. And we're going to hear from two fantastic guests. We're going to talk a bit about exploring ancient Egyptian wonders. Professor Ola El Aghizi, professor uh, at the Faculty of Archaeology at Cairo University. She actually recently made a fantastic discovery with her team. Uh, a sarcophagus, ancient sarcophagus, buried beneath the sands at Cairo, hailed as a dream discovery by archaeologists. There's uh, a lot of media attention around this. There's actually articles um, online you can check out. You might have this one in the Guardian actually re- relatively recently. Um, so this burial chamber remained undisturbed for thousands of years and only just discovered for the first time by um, Professor Ola Elagizi and her team. So she's going to be talking a bit about that and uh, a show that she's got on National Geographic which is all about the processes involved with discovering um, discoveries such as this which is yeah, super super cool. So we're absolutely delighted to, to, to have spoken to her. And we also got Professor Robert Richardson. He's been on the show a couple of times. So really pleased to chat to him again. And he's used robots. This is one of his many projects. He's a professor of robotics. He's used robots to explore the Great Pyramid of Giza, where, using uh, these robotic methods, he actually discovered um, secret chambers in there. So, yeah, some pretty spooky and cool stuff for you today, hopefully. So I'm going to stop chatting now. I'm going to get this show kicked right off. Um, And also, as always, we're going to be backing this up with some tunes as well. So the the guests themselves have some suggestions for us to get those on um, and as always if you want to join in please do uh, pop me a message or an email and on a future show you'll be hearing your tunes being played for you just you okay right anyway let's kick this show off shall we Cornwall Club on Coast FM Uh, he's director of the Institute of Design, Robotics and Optimization, and director of the Leeds EPSRC National Facility for Innovative Robotic Systems, which is a world class, over four million pound facility for designing and creating robotic systems. And of course, he's professor of robotics um, at the University of Leeds. Now he's talking a bit as well about the UK Festival of Robotics, which has been a recent festival um, here in the UK, of course, and the website for that, ukras.org. Dot UK forward slash robotics dash week that tells you all about the kind of events that they were running and actually you can still check out some of the stuff they've got on there do urge you to do it if you've got any, any kind of interest at all in robotic systems I mean some of these uh, projects that uh, Professor Richardson has been involved with are simply mind blowing now I don't want to steal too much from this interview I want to let you kind of explore it for yourself but I'll just give you a little sneak preview, okay? One of the projects he's works on, which I, I just find absolutely fascinating, he built a robot to explore um, the Great Pyramid of Giza, and actually using this robot they discovered a few years ago, um, ancient texts that had never before uh, been seen. So, you know, this, this ro- the robotic explorer of the pyramid, I mean, how cool is that? Also, a bit of a spooky detail to that. <laughs> yeah, something spooky happened. I'm not going to say what, and I'll just have to let you listen, won't I? So... Are there ghosts exploring the pyramid as well? I don't know. Maybe. Maybe. I mean, I'm a man of science, but I don't know. I don't know. Anyway, we'll have to listen in. He also tells us about all the kind of recent things that he's been involved with. Uh, You know what? I'm not going to spoil any of that. I'm just going to let him explain that because, yeah, as I say, this is slightly mind-blowing. So that's enough chat for me. Sorry, mega long introduction with me blabbing on. Let's get the man himself on. This is Professor Robert Richardson. So pleased to have you with us, Professor Richardson. Thank you very much indeed. Here he is. Uh, I'm going to have to warn you, actually, just at the start as well. I think I I might have done this last time to you, but I just thought, you know, just to be a little bit kinder, I'll give you a tiny bit of warning at the beginning of the interview that I think it might be time for another song request, if that's all right, at the end of uh, of our chat. Is that all right? (laughs) to think about some kind of um, some kind of song then yeah well it could be like danger high voltage couldn't it or something with a robot theme <laughs> <laughs> Uh, anyway, Absolutely. yeah, if, if, if you're all good to go, I, I'll just ask you, um, first of all, if you could just, um, well, I guess just to introduce yourself uh, briefly, if, if you like, just say your name, basically, and um, yeah, perhaps a bit about your role, if, if you would like to, and yeah, then I'll fire some questions away, so whenever you're ready, just, just jump in. Yeah, so good morning. Yeah, so um, my name is Professor Robert Richardson from the University of Leeds, um, Professor of Robotics, and do all kinds of things, in especially um, robots that can repair and inspect at the real world, so our environment, such as bridges and roads. And I'm also the chair of the UK RAS network, which is a network of 33 universities across the UK that seeks to um, really kind of push the research uh, of robotics forward in the UK. 
Oh, thank you very much, Professor Richardson. Yeah, absolute pleasure to have you um, with us again. Now, I, I do remember last time. Yeah, we had an absolutely fantastic chat about um, about robots ahead of the ahead of the festival. And I, I remember actually talking to you. And you must get sick of talking about this particular robot. You probably know what I'm about to mention now. But the Jedi robot that you used to explore the uh, Great Pyramid of Giza. I, I still think that's just the coolest thing I've ever heard. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. So I, I, I still have um, flashbacks on that. So I'm still still hoping to do some more on it. So that was a robot that explored the Great Pyramid of Giza, as um, you may recall. That, that was amazing. And um, yeah, so we've still, we still got unanswered questions there and we hope to do it again at some point. And I, th- I think that's just such a, a such a brilliant example because I think it just really goes to show just the incredible variety of tasks that robots could be used for, right? Because I mean that is that's bound to be something that someone hadn't kind of thought about before. You know, the average person is not going to consider that as a task that a robot could help with. The, you know, exploration of ancient kind of sites. So I just think it's remarkable. It's such a good example. Yeah, absolutely. So, so robots can do all, all, all manner of things, like say from exploring ancient sites to new discovery. So there's lots of work with robots that are doing chemical analysis, chemical discovery, um, to do manufacturing, of course, to make the world more efficient and more environmentally friendly. Service robots in our houses and, and in our shops and things to do things like hoovering, cleaning, and like, like firefighting drones. So the list goes on. So really any task that is um, difficult, repetitive, um, dangerous robots are the, the best things to do for them. Yeah, I mean, we, we've heard um, yeah a, a fantastic um, yeah pastime we're chatting about. I think we also touched on uh, kind of surgical robots as well. I mean, I think that's a, another kind of example really that it just goes to show the kind of remarkable uses that that people can can find and probably already know about actually if they stop to think of it. Because I can see I've actually got some of the research in front of me um, here, you know, about people's kind of attitudes and kind of perceptions about robots. And I'm sure actually there are probably tons more that we kind of just take for granted. Yes, yeah, so, so in the medical domain, um, so, so there's, there's definitely an increasing trend towards um, surgical robots. And it may become the point, in fact, where people um, are really refusing to be um, to have surgery by, by actually people themselves. They want, of course, people are involved in the loop, but um, robots have the precision and the accuracy and they can operate through smaller holes. And, of course, in surgery, um, that, that's definitely a, a big thing. So, yes, yeah, so robots um, really can do so much that we can really help society. And that's what I'm really keen to advocate, that we can use them to really make make a difference a positive difference yeah, fantastic. And um, ahead of the um, yeah, as I say, the UK Festival of Robotics. Um, I wonder what kind of a, yeah, kind of, kind of focus that you've got there this time around. Have you got any kind of particular areas that you'll be chatting to people about? Yes, yeah, so the UK Festival of Robotics. Um, we have a whole host of different activities. So there's not one particular focus. And um, we have online events and we have um, physical events. Uh, yeah, it's, it's really kind of people can go and they can do these events and understand. Okay, well, I guess the common thread is understanding the future of robotics. What what are we doing? How can we use robots um, in in the future? And of course, people people also to think about how do they want robots to be used because uh, they want to want to make sure people um, are, are encouraged and have a positive outcome from this. So, for example, some of the things that we're up to, um, we have um, an event called Robot Lab Live. Um, in that event, you can go and see nine university labs live across the UK and you can effectively drop into them and you can flip between them and you can see them doing live demonstrations of really cool futuristic robot stuff and we have a live event um, of our robot talk live podcast so we do a podcast called robot talk um, and that's on monday and people can go and actually listen to that and, and do that live we have an event on thursday which is about um how to start a career in robotics so people who are thinking well you know i'm starting out i just don't know how to get into robotics they can go online and they can find out more about that and then also physical events so for example the national rail museum in york um are having an exhibit um on the future of public transport the UK Atomic Energy Authority, um, which is doing really amazing stuff with fusion, really, you know, futuristic. And we we are the leading of the world in that respect in many, in many respects. And um, we're going to open their doors for the first time in their facility in race in, in Abington. So you can go in there and see robots doing things and exploring. So just some examples of loads of things going on. And hopefully people can drop in and watch online. Yeah, well, what, what a range of events. Yeah, that sounds absolutely fantastic, actually. I think a, a perfect place, I mean, to be honest, to me, it sounds like a perfect place to go, not not only if you are already kind of in that sector and you're already fascinated with robots, perhaps even work, you know, in robotics, but but also uh, it kind of sounds as fascinating for anyone else as well, anyone who doesn't really know where to even start, when to think about robots and perhaps has, has only just thought about it for the first time this week, chatting to you, you know, on the radio today. So I think it's, it sounds like a great event. 
Absolutely, yes. I think um, people who are experts will get something out of it because they'll be able to see what's going on. But also just just people who are curious, you know, what, what actually is a robot, what is going on, what are people doing in labs? And because they're live, this is the beauty that I mentioned the demonstration we're doing live. Because they're live demonstrations, things are going to go wrong. Things are not going to work as they should do. And I think you get to see the real the real robots because we can all put together lovely glossy YouTube videos <laughs> and make it look perfect. But you'll go, you'll be able to see for live, like you're in the lab, and that's going to be really cool. It's, it reminds me a bit. I don't know if it's kind of a, yeah. I don't know if there's any kind of parallels there, but it's that kind of classic joke about kind of um, you know coders, and they say like, oh, if it's it's working, we don't know why. Don't touch it. Just leave it. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Absolutely, and it never works in demo. It's, it's, it's unbelievable how you can have something working perfectly um, a few minutes beforehand and a live <laughs> demonstration, and for some reason the gremlin appears and it doesn't work anymore. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> oh, amazing. And I, I was wondering as well if um, Prof Richardson, uh, obviously, you know, we don't have to touch on too much of this because obviously I'm aware of your time today, but I was just thinking about some kind of talking to you about some of your. I don't know if you could kind of tell us a bit about what you're kind of currently up to, because obviously, yeah, we touched on at the beginning the uh, the Jedi robot, which is just oh, just absolutely fascinating. I wonder if you could tell us about anything that you're up to, you know, at, at the moment. You said you might be working on some kind of more projects down that kind of avenue, or are there other kind of focuses that you've got at the moment? So it would be great to hear a little yeah. bit. Sure, yeah, yeah. So, um yeah, at the moment, we're doing um, loads of interesting research across a really kind of broad range of things. One area is what we call self-repairing cities. So cities, of course, they, we use them for roads, for driving vehicles. Um, the, the, in the city, there's all kind of pipes and, and um, electric supplies and that sort of thing. Um, but these degrade, and we have roadworks, and we have pollution, all these kind of problems. And, and uh, amazingly, um, underground, the amount of water, the amount of good quality water that leaks out of pipes is just unbelievable. So we're working on a project a quite large project to look at how we can use robots to make our city infrastructure that that means like the roads the bridges um make it self-repairing um so that we don't have any of these problems so for example one project we're looking at a swarm of small robots that live inside pipes wow. and they scurry around they look at the pipe walls and they try and find leaks and then hopefully they can fix the leaks and we don't even know that there was ever a leak in the first place Wow, gosh, yeah, that's a bit mind blowing. I think that's yeah, absolutely, absolutely incredible. I wonder if there's any places for people to kind of, um, I don't know. Uh, obviously, you know that there is. We will get to the kind of links for the um, UK Festival of Robotics as well. But I wonder if there's any links for people to learn a bit more about your work. Cause, I mean, that does sound fascinating. Do you do you like a Twitter page or things like that that people can follow? Yes, they can go to our website, which is Real Robotics. Um, especially yeah, Real Robotics. Um, code at uk and they can go on there and they can actually um see some of our work and we have actually lots of um documentaries um so we have a documentary on the egypt um, project which is like an hour long um and that's good and that, that kind of is like a fly on the wall documentary and it shows the highs and the lows and the challenges and the stresses and the and the beauty of success you know the when things come together and it just works oh fantastic yeah it must have been quite a mind-blowing moment actually when you saw that text appear because obviously you know when you reveal the kind of text using the robot what was it like seeing that on the screen i bet, I bet you're thinking yeah there we go we've won it <laughs> so, so yeah when we when we found so the, the challenge was we were up there we put the camera through but with the um the, the man in charge wasn't there so we had to go back to the hotel spend the entire night and not turn the camera on <laughs> <laughs> so we had the whole night with the camera looking at well, could be anything and we don't know and then the following morning we had to go and then turn the camera on then we discovered it so it was a very strange sort of delayed of the excitement relief <laughs> Um, but also wishing, you know, I just want to press just one. No, you can't touch that. You can't see it until the main man's hit. <laughs> oh, amazing. What would have been the worst for it if you turn it on? It was just like a Pepsi can there or something. You think, oh, <laughs> what? <laughs> it could have been absolutely anything. And interesting, actually, in, in this hidden place, there is actually a ticket um, a ticket that someone had bought to enter the pyramid at some point, probably like 20, 30 years ago. Huh. Uh, which is really bizarre. So, did a, an animal carry it there at some point? Or how, there's no way of getting in there. So, how did this this, this ticket? appear in there and of course you only see it when you're inside the shaft so yes yeah, very strange slightly spooky as well i think yeah <laughs> yes <laughs> oh, fantastic yeah <laughs> evidence of the of the real ghosts in the pyramid as well as the kind of text yeah i love it <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. oh thank you professor richardson uh, yeah i wonder if well i, I guess yeah just um i am I, i'm realizing I, i'm forcing you to veer off the uh, uk festival of robotics week i mean it's all all yeah fantastic stuff but i wonder if we could just yeah just maybe remind listeners on on how to get involved with the week you said that you, they could um yeah tune in uh remotely as well i understand so that that'd be cool to kind of tell them how to do that as well as obviously yeah and anything else that they can do to get involved will be will be awesome 
Yes, to, to, get, to get involved, um, if you go to our website, which is UKRAS, that's U-K-R-A-S, that's one word, UKRAS.org.uk, um, on there they'll find um, loads of information about the different things, the links to the online event and also where the physical in-person events are happening. They can also go to our Twitter, which is UK Robotics, and on there equally they'll see the t- some tweets about what we're doing and, and how to get involved. Oh, thank you very much indeed, Professor Richardson. Now, I haven't forgotten. You, you'll be you'll be very sad to know I haven't forgotten about this part, but it is the song request time. It's time to put you right on the spot, I'm afraid. So, um, yeah, have, have you got any thoughts? <laughs> yeah, I mean, from our discussion, um, it makes me think about um, the, the quest to make robots that work and, and the challenges, and sometimes you're doing them, sometimes they don't work, and they don't do things. So uh, it came to my mind was a Rocky theme tune, the... the, the um, <laughs> The, the, the challenge, the success, and the, finally the satisfaction of actually producing something that works and does what it should do. <laughs> oh, yeah, what a choice. Absolutely fantastic. Well, I'll get, I'll get that straight on. <laughs> oh, Professor Richardson, <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. I just, just want to double check, actually, basically that, um, well, a couple of things. A, that you're all happy with everything that I asked today, of course, before this goes out later today. And also, um, yeah, just check that you've got everything across. You want to, if you want to reiterate anything or any kind of links or anything like that that you'd like to get across that you didn't get the chance to get, you, you're very welcome to. I'll just check with you, basically. So if you want to find out more about um, the work we do at University of Leeds um, in weird and wonderful robots, do check out our website, which is realrobotics.co.uk. Oh, thank you very much indeed. Well, I'll let you go. And the, uh, yeah, the Rocky theme is coming on right away, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> oh, thank you very much. Well, have a great rest of the day. And uh, yeah, ho- hopefully we can catch you again on the show. Really look forward to it, if, if so. So hopefully. <laughs> Great, thank you. That's really good. Thanks very much to Professor Robert Richards. And now moving on with the show. Next up, it is Professor Ola Elegizi from the University of Cairo, a real archaeologist. Exciting stuff. She's actually talking about uh, this fantastic discovery she's recently made. So listen carefully because this is some real spooky stuff, to be honest. A couple of spooky things in this show, isn't there? Anyway, right, let's crack on. Hello, Ben. Oh, hello. It's very, very nice to have you on the show. Thank you very much for this, Ola. It's yeah, absolute uh, honour to be speaking with you today. So how are you doing? I'm fine, thank you. Excellent. Well, if you're all good to go, could I think I'll just ask you if that's all right. I'll give you the chance just to um, just jump in and perhaps introduce yourself a little bit before I, yeah, fire some questions away, if that's okay. So whatever you are ready, right. just jump in. Okay. All right, I am Ola Elagizi. I am uh, an Egyptologist. I am the professor, a uh, professor of an ancient Egyptian language in the uh, Faculty of Archaeology, Cairo University. I'm an emeritus professor, and I am uh, the head of the team of excavations in uh, Saqqara since 2005 up till now. Oh, fantastic! Well, thank you very much, Ola. What was it? What a truly fascinating area that you're that you're involved with. There's so many questions I, I want to ask you, but obviously it won't keep you too long today. But I guess yeah, I mean one of the really key things straight away is I, hey, you've made a, an absolutely remarkable discovery recently. I wonder if you could tell our listeners just a little bit about it. Well, uh, uh, Saqqara is a very rich area, and it has been the capital of Egypt since the First Dynasty, and it uh, uh, remained as a, a very uh, important administrative uh, capital or administrative center. So lots of uh, uh, army generals from the New Kingdom were buried in, uh, in part of the, uh, this area of uh, the necropolis of Saqqara. So uh, where we are digging, there is uh, uh, we have uh, discovered uh, around uh, thirty-five tombs uh, from uh, the time of Ramses II. But Gosh. not all. But I did not all uh, discover. I, I've discovered five till now. Uh, the the rest were discovered in the eighties. But uh, the most important thing that these uh, generals, great grand generals of the army and our uh, military men who who are buried here are very important and are very well known for Europe uh, because there are lots of blocks from these to their tombs, which are already in the museum since the 19th century. But for our discovery, we discovered last year the tomb of uh, the, uh, the man called Tahemuya, who is the head of the treasury and the head of the cattle and the offerings of Upper and Lower Egypt in the time of Ramses II. So we might we might equal him now to a minister of finance or. Uh, 
yes, Minister of Finance. So last year we found the tomb. This year we found we went in uh, down to the shaft into the shaft, which is eight meters deep, and we uh, we found a chamber. The chamber led us to another slope or another descending uh, slope with uh, full of sand. Which, um, uh, when we cleared the sand, we found the room or uh, the, the chamber where the the sarcophagus was placed. The sarcophagus is important, of course, because it is the sarcophagus of the owner of the tomb. And it is uh, the same style, it has the same style as all sarcophagi of the New Kingdom of the same area. So that's what made us, uh, what was clear for us to, for the dating of the sarcophagus. And of course, when we found the name of the owner, uh, the name of the deceased on the sarcophagus, we were sure that it is the sarcophagus of the owner of the, the tomb itself. Gosh, it sounds like an incredibly kind of um, rich area. I mean, you have five discoveries, and you're saying kind of you, you've done in the area. I mean, that's absolutely fantastic. I mean, the experience of um, of locating, you know, these these kind of tombs and these sarcophagus. I mean, I, I can imagine that kind of never gets old. I mean, even though you've done it a few times now, is it does it just kind of always feel just so spectacular when you're kind of coming across these these areas? Well, yes. It every time it uh, it uh, it is a feeling. It's amazing. It's uh, 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 incredible because even if I find a very small piece with just two lines of texts, it is important. Every every small object, uh, a jar, a pottery jar, alabaster uh, jars, uh, canopic jars, all these, uh, even if they are broken, not complete. They are important and they are interesting in the dating and in the study of the style of these objects, uh, because of course every every part of this uh, these uh, has to be studied uh, to uh, for their style and for their material and so it all all any discovery is very very uh, important. Oh, fantastic yeah it sounds incredible i mean what's the because I, I can imagine kind of people listening in i can kind of imagining you know you, this this process of kind of going down i mean going on the shaft for example and uh, you know going into these kind of chambers what's it all like because it sounds to be honest it sounds a bit a bit scary almost going you know going down these shafts and things what's that process like well uh, it was scary at the beginning but but, but i've been doing this for the, for the 10 year, uh, last years maybe uh, if if not more uh, i know the way to go down my workers are very sure and i are very uh, uh, careful with me uh, and uh, i go i am I'm, I'm well uh, seated in this bucket as you say so I don't feel any uh, fry. Uh, uh, I'm not afraid at all uh, now. But when you enter the chambers, of course, you uh, you imagine that the chamber has has to be uh, stuffy and uh, 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 and you got the claustrophobia yes. from uh, going into the. But no, you do not feel that at all. The the chambers are quite wide, uh, uh, three and a half meters uh, square. So we, you can sit happy inside, even and when it's hot up, uh, uh, upstairs or uh, on the on, on the surface, it's very nice inside to be uh, seated uh, in the shade. And then, uh, of course, the only problem is that you have sometimes to go down on a on sand on a very uh, on lots of sand. Uh, so I have to crawl on my uh, leg uh, my. Uh, my arms and legs to to reach the uh, the area where the sarcophagus is. So this is a bit scary, but well, uh, yeah, uh, I managed to do it, and the workers around me uh, helped me a lot. Now this is this is going to be a bit of a strange question, but I, I've always kind of wanted to know this. What does it kind of smell like down there? Is it quite a fresh smell, or does it smell kind of? I don't know. Quite, I don't know. Kind of no, dampy. It has or? No, smell. no, I don't. I don't feel any smell at all. Wow. Okay. No smell at all. The only scary thing about this uh, the, uh, these chambers that the walls and the ceiling are not very uh, safe. 
Yes. We, we, we have to look at the ceilings first and see how, if there are cracks or not, because we find some, uh, uh, some uh, small fragments of ceiling on the ground. So I know that it could be dangerous, it could fall. So we put some cement on those cracks and follow up every day to see if the, uh, the, the, these cement have uh, been cracked also or are they as stable as we put them the first time. And of course, we do some, uh, some consolidation to the, for the ceiling and the walls. And sometimes we put blocks of limestone blocks that we find as if it was a, a pillar to support the, the ceiling. Yeah, gotcha. So it almost sounds a little bit like, um, I guess, like a process of kind of going into like a cave system where you obviously have to make it safe to, to kind of explore a bit further. And it sounds a bit like that. Yes, yes of course. Yes. Because sometimes, I, well, in some cases, I sit inside and the workers are, uh, are removing or clearing the sand around me to look for other things because sometimes the galleries inside not not in this case but uh, last year it was the so the galleries are very very deep uh, very long uh, and very extended uh, so we have to uh, look at all the places where uh, the galleries go to because uh, sometimes we find other uh, burials yes the, the, uh, the, these shafts and these chambers have been looted uh, long ago, maybe in the 19th century, maybe earlier, uh, earlier, much earlier. And uh, the, 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 the tombs also maybe uh, uh, 300 years later or 400 years later had been used again by other uh, individuals. Yes, yes, gotcha. Yeah, so I'm thinking about the kind of, um, I guess, like the timelines involved, because it, it kind of sounds like, uh, you know, to really, truly capture everything, because, you know, you were saying that, you know, any kind of, even what other people might think as a, as a small object, right, that can have, you know, incredible kind of history attached to it. So it sounds like it's actually quite a, a process where you've got to be really careful and make sure you kind of look for absolutely everything so you don't kind of miss any any small objects that kind of have that history. Does it take quite a long time, presumably, to, yes. to kind of go? Yes, through these terms. Yes, of course, because any, uh, for instance, this sarcophagus, when we look at it, we look at the lid of the sarcophagus, it has a, it's a, what we call anthropoid because uh, it has the face of the deceased uh, and his beard and the, the arms crossed on the chest. Every small details, every uh, drawing on the chest could be different yes. than another one. So this makes, uh, gives us another theory it might, we can write about it that okay uh, in this uh, time uh, in this tomb the the sarcophagus showed us such and such style which is different than the previous one found so uh, that means that in the uh, the time of Ramses II beginning the year for instance 19 or 20 of his reign there has been a change in the style you see how uh, accurate it has to be yes. that uh, even between the year f the year ten and the year twenty of Ramses the uh, second or later, there has been changes in the style of uh, of uh, all objects, even in the name of the king himself, the way he writes his name. God, so gotcha. all, yeah. <laughs> yes, all these things help us date the uh, an accurate date for the deceased and for the tomb itself. Gosh, yeah, no, I can imagine this kind of really detailed sort of um, like t timeline emerging with all the kind of various objects, and and, and actually th that kind of makes sense then why everything, even even the kind of small objects, they are just so vital because presumably the more that you have like that, the more you can almost like punctuate that timeline and kind of work out what yeah. was going on. Yes, exactly. Oh, yes, that sounds fantastic. Yeah, so I understand. I mean, a lot of these kind of uh, well, we're going to get some insights, aren't we, into into these uh, into this some of these kind of discoveries in in this series, Lost Treasures of Egypt. I mean, it does sound yes. it does sound and awesome. When you uh, when you watch uh, the uh, the National Geographic uh, every Sunday at eight uh, on the National Geographic Channel, you will see me crawling uh, on my legs <laughs> and uh, uh, on, on well, you will find you look at uh, very amazing things. So please, everyone to watch. Everyone has to watch this uh, uh, movie. 
Oh, it sounds sounds absolutely fantastic. I, I bet the uh, the camera crew actually had a had a fantastic time doing that. I can imagine that must just be sort of a, a dream <laughs> yes. job going down there and following you and looking yes, at all these it things. Was, it, it was for them the first time, I'm sure. <laughs> I bet they were a bit frightened actually, like watching horror yes. films and then going down. <laughs> of course, and they were frightened for their camera also. <laughs> yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. Can't have any damage. Oh, brilliant. Oh, yeah. Well, I, I do hope. Uh, yeah, our listeners, um, go ahead and yeah, follow your kind of adventures in the, in this series. Sounds absolutely absolutely fantastic and you know what i was thinking actually because i don't i don't know if you might agree with this but i was thinking i kind of need to get you a little theme tune on the show today just to say just to say thank you now is it going to be something like the indiana jones theme i don't know that's up to you what are you thinking can i get you a song on to say thank you (laughs) (laughs) well uh, well it is a type of indiana jones uh, of course and uh (laughs) But uh, for real, for real, that's uh, the difference. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's a step up, isn't it? That's fantastic. I think yeah. I might have to play it for you then in that case. Thank you very much, Charlie. Yeah, it's been a, yeah absolute yeah, well. pleasure talking to you and really fascinating um, area that you're in. So catch you soon, hopefully. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, next time. <laughs> <laughs> next time you find another one. <laughs> Chat to you then. Yes. I, I, yes. <laughs> I, I, be sure to find something else. <laughs> oh, excellent. Give us a call. <laughs> Thank you, Ola. Goodbye for now. Goodbye. Goodbye. Thanks.